for myself as program manager because I love to recruit talent such as James Scott, your speaker here today. I first uh, heard him speak last fall at the uh, Gettysburg Conference where there were a lot of World War II speakers, so I was able to uh, prevail on him to come down to talk to us. Uh, so I want to welcome you all to this, and I want to uh, thank our sponsors that are making this possible now. Some of our local sponsors we've got. Please um, patronize our sponsors. We've got eGolf, eGolf Jeep, because of now we've got our World War II Jeep in the museum, so eGolf was a natural. We've got O.B. Taylor's Toy Store, which of course has all the scale models of tanks and planes, etc., from World War II. The Cherry Tree, right across the street from the museum, has all kind of uh, home decor and so forth. But Mr. Mike Cherry is also a weapons expert that has some vintage weapons going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So if you're a collector, you see Mr. Cherry. Uh, TVS, uh, over on the edge of town, that uh, does military contracts for providing uh, packaged food products and also for food banks. And our latest sponsor just today, Mr. Jimmy Harris with Ace Hardware. Jimmy, are you here? I don't know if he was going to be able to make it or not. Uh, he's on TV. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a bigger audience. So uh, Ace Hardware just down the street, so please uh, give your business to, to uh, Ace Hardware. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over. The envelope, please. Oh, the envelope, please. Excuse me, I've got a prop here and forgot. Uh, on your way out, if you too would like to help make programs like this possible, where we are bringing in nationally known speakers, we're really upping our game this year, uh, just pick up an envelope from me or a lady in red here. Stand up, lady in red. Michael Robertson, our treasurer. She loves to receive your money. And uh, you can take an envelope home and then mail it back with a contribution for us. I'm Janice Allen. Um, the first thing I want to do is offer you to put your name and email address on one of these clipboards if you do not already get emails from the museum to let you know about programs like this. So we'll just pass this. Okay, if you don't have an email, okay, that's fine. If you already get emails, then just pass it to the next person. But we want to let you know about things like this if you are interested in doing that. It's my pleasure to introduce this fine group of World War II veterans to you uh, just before we have our speaker. And I'm going to ask if you would all stand for a minute, please. We'll start on the end. Can you stand? <laughs> Nursing manager and nursing trainer 
She served at Fort Lewis, Washington State at the time when our American soldiers who had been prisoners of war in Japan and in the islands were being sent back across the Pacific. This was the first lovely face some of them saw once they got back to the <laughs> Poor, Marine, <laughs> U.S. Marines, uh, was a um, an aircraft mechanic who served of the. Um, see if I get this right. F four U Corsair. That's right. In the Philippines That's and right. China. China after the war. After the war. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Joe Cooper, U.S. Navy gunner, served on the battleship USS Amity Bay. It was attacked by a kamikaze pilot. He and his, the rest of his shipmates abandoned ship, managed to not get eaten by the sharks taken to the USS Minneapolis, where they watched their ship burn. <laughs> then he got out of the Navy and joined the Army and went to Europe during the Berlin airlift, and then to Korea, where he was again a gunner. Mr. Joe Cooper. folks. Thank you so much for coming today. We, uh, we really did not expect this turnout. In fact, initially, we only reserved half of the robo room, but thanks to the uh, responsiveness of the uh, library, uh, we've now really uh, filled the whole thing. And uh, it makes me really proud of all of you uh, for, for being so proud uh, of, our, of our veterans. Um, this spring of, uh, of this year, 2022, 20, uh, is the 80th anniversary of when the 16 crews uh, from the Doolittle Raid, uh, those of uh, them that had survived the initial raid, were finding their way out of China, or unfortunately some of them into Japanese POW camps. So at this time of year, it's always good to remember that there are those who made that sacrifice willingly in fact, as you'll hear from uh, James Scott, the, uh, the author of this magnificent book, um, there was a waiting list, a waiting line aboard the USS Hornet of flight crews who wanted to go in place of the crews that actually did. And not one of those 80 men, of those 16 crews, stepped aside and said, well, actually, somebody else can take my place. Every one of them knew that once they took off, there was no coming back to the Hornet, because even if they had a mechanical problem or whatever, there's no way to land a B-25 on the Hornet. So it was, it was off and gone to Japan or, or wherever. So God bless that spirit. Um, one personal side I'd like to make, uh, my wife, bless her, gifted me last June with a flight on a B-25 in Ohio. And it was one of the greatest half hours uh, I've ever spent in my life. I picked up the shirt uh, along the way. And uh, my advice to you is if you ever have an opportunity, if anybody ever says, gee, would you like a ride on a B-25, don't miss it. Uh, and uh, the 80 people we are honoring today um, certainly deserve you know, all the respect that goes with that. So uh, with that, I would like to, uh, to introduce James Scott uh, as I think you've read in different sources, uh, uh, James was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize uh, for this book. He has won awards uh, for <coughs> other books as well on World War II. Uh, he spent a year in Japan uh, that stimulated his interest in, in the subject uh, that, that we're going to be talking about today. And he'll tell us more about himself. But he is, he is really a gentleman uh, that, that you're, you're honored uh, to meet. Uh, James, please uh, join us. <coughs> 
afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Good. Wonderful. Uh, I just want to echo what Janice and Mike said about what a privilege it is to have so many amazing World War II veterans with us today. We represent so many incredible stories of that conflict. D-Day, the Omni Bay, to the nurses who welcomed our troops home and treated our troops in New Guinea, our fighter pilots. Thank you all for everything you guys did. And uh, as a reminder today, when we talk about the Doolittle Raid, just how important the sacrifices of our young men and women were um, seven decades ago, more than seven decades ago, in, in, in preserving our freedom and making this country the way it is today. So join me in another round of applause for our veterans. That are here today. Is that better? <laughs> okay. um, and also, thanks to all of our veterans from other conflicts that are here. I'd love to see a show of hands of how many people are, are veterans of all of our different conflicts, from World War II all the way up through, if you could raise your hand. So thank you guys as well. So, uh, <laughs> um, I also want to start off and say a, a great thanks to, to, to all the folks with the Veterans um, uh, Museum here in town. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, that, done a fantastic job putting together the speaker series, um, this wonderful lunch we had with our veterans earlier today, uh, and all the hard and tireless work that goes into preserving the legacy of our men and women in the uniform. And so, Mike, thank you. Greg, thank you. Janice, uh, who I know is really the, the worker bee of the bunch from what I hear. Uh, Michael as well. Everybody involved, thank you guys uh, for all you do um, to, to honor the service and legacy of our veterans. Thank you guys. Now, um, the Doolittle Ring. It was America's answer to the attack on Pearl Harbor. The surprise attack on Tokyo, executed just four months after the Japanese struck Hawaii. It was a virtual suicide mission. 16 bombers crewed by 80 young men who flew a one-way mission to pummel Japan's factories, warehouses, and shipyards, and then escape to free China. But it was much more than just a bombing raid. Raid was a powerful tonic needed to rally a shell-shocked nation, to assure the U.S. public in its darkest hour that in the end, America would prevail. America would win. The effect the raid had on this country more than seven decades ago was profound. Americans were so moved by the heroism of these airmen that a war bond poster signed by Mission Commander Jimmy Doolittle fetched a staggering $4 million dollars in 1942. That's the equivalent of $58 million today for a signed poster. A town in Missouri went so far as to change its name to Doolittle in his honor. You go there today, Doolittle, Missouri, still, still carries the name of Jimmy Doolittle. And of course, the raid had an even greater impact on the outcome in the direction of the war. The raid prompted the Japanese in the summer of 1942 to make an ill fated grab for Midway. Proved a disastrous naval battle, cost them four aircraft carriers in a day, and shifted the balance of power in the Pacific back in favor of the United States. But it was the Chinese who paid the largest price. Japan, outraged by the attack, launched a retaliatory campaign that summer that killed an estimated 250,000 men, women, and children, and prompted comparisons to the rape of Nanking. All of these things happened because of one raid is of 16 bombers crewed by 80 young volunteer airmen. And that's what makes the Doolittle Raid one of the greatest stories of World War II. Now, the Doolittle Raid really began on the morning America entered World War II. In the pre-dawn hours of that Sunday, December 7, 1941, six Japanese aircraft carriers, at the time the largest carrier task force that had ever put to sea, cut through the dark swells 230 miles north of Pearl Harbor. Throughout those carriers, Japanese airmen rose early, dressed in clean loincloths and pressed uniforms, pausing alongside Shinto shrines to pray for victory and sip sake before heading topside to their planes. The faint light of dawn punctured the morning clouds and the carriers increased speed and swung into the wind to prepare the launch. 183 fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes roared off the carrier's deck in the first wave of the attack, followed by a second strike of 167 
The attack on Pearl Harbor was more than just a raid. It was a dramatic opening act of war against the United States. A surgical strike designed to mortally wound America's powerful Pacific fleet anchored in the cool Hawaiian waters. Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, Yamamoto, the architect of the attack, knew it was imperative for Japan to sideline the United States before the war ever even began. Quote, the fate of our empire, he warned, depends upon this operation. That Sunday morning, American forces slumbered. Troops had been out the night before, cruising down Honolulu's famous hotel street, lined with tattoo parlors, shooting galleries, and uh, pinball joints. Others had watched Clark Gable as a frontier con man in the movie Honky Tonk, or attended the finals in the battles of the band at Pearl Harbor's block recreation site. Japanese planes appeared in the skies over Pearl Harbor that Sunday morning. America was caught completely off guard. This is actually a captured Japanese photograph of the opening shots of the attack. And you can see Ford Island here in the foreground. You can see all the battleships moored side by side. You can see the spray coming up from some of the early blasts um, there uh, over Pearl Harbor. Now, Pearl Harbor resembled a parking lot that morning with 94 ships in port, almost half of the entire Pacific fleet. Japanese pilots immediately zeroed in on the nine battleships which were moored side by side. Again, this is another Japanese photograph, and it shows the oil spilling out of the battleships, Oklahoma, in the top right, and the West Virginia. Japanese strategists had perfected the plan of attack down to the use of wooden torpedo fins needed to run in Pearl Harbor's shallow waters. Here, a rescue boat attempts to pull sailors um, out of the water from the battleship West Virginia, which was hit by as many as nine torpedoes that day. Of course, the smoke from the burning battleships literally darkened the horizon for miles. In addition to targeting the Navy's warships, Japanese forces zeroed in on Hawaii's airfields, including the Naval Air Station at Pearl Harbor, ultimately destroying almost 200 planes that the attack on Pearl Harbor destroyed or damaged 18 ships, including eight battleships. The picture here is the capsized battleship Oklahoma. And of course, the human toll proved horrific. Casualties among soldiers, sailors, Marines, and civilians soared to more than 3,500, a figure that counted uh, 2,403 people. President Roosevelt was in the White House finishing up his lunch when news of the attack reached Washington. That afternoon, as damage reports continued to pour in, he wrote what was arguably his most famous speech, even though it totaled barely 500 words. His use of the word infamy, as his son later noted, would forever describe what happened that day. The next day, at 12.30 p.m., he delivered that speech before Congress, asking for a declaration of war. Now, personally, Roosevelt was sickened by the attack, and he knew that the immediate patriotism that flared up in the days afterwards would prove short-lived. He also knew that America was in no position to go on a sustained offensive. It would take much of 1942, in fact, to enlist and train new troops, build more ships, planes, rifles, and bullets. Yet he also knew that the American public's patience would not survive that long. So before rescuers could even pull all the dead from the oily waters of Pearl Harbor, he summoned his senior military advisors and demanded America find a way to strike back. Not an attack on some far-flung island in the Japanese Empire, but an attack directly on Tokyo. Now the challenge war planners faced was just how to go about doing this. America had no bases in the region from which to operate. In addition to the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had seized Guam and Wake from the United States. The Philippines was under siege and would soon fall. Japanese had likewise taken Hong Kong and Singapore from the British, uh, and even the oil-rich Dutch East Indies from the Netherlands. Literally in a few short months, Japan had built an empire stretched across more than 20 million square miles in seven time zones. <clears throat> not only did the United States not have bases in the region from which to operate, but America's aircraft carriers, the three that we had in the Pacific at that time at the beginning of the war, uh, and fortunately escaped destruction at Pearl Harbor were seen as far too valuable to risk sending all the way across the Pacific into the enemy's backyard um, and, and risk destruction <coughs> at that 
None of this, however, mattered to FDR, who in all of his meetings with his senior air commander, Lieutenant General Hap Arnold, and his senior naval commander, Admiral Ernest King, continued to press his leaders to find a way to strike back. Now, while at Norfolk in early January of 1942, one of Admiral King's staffers, who's gone down to check out the, the aircraft carrier Hornet, which was about to come online, happened to notice a runway marked up to resemble the deck of an aircraft carrier. And he saw pilots practicing takeoffs from it. And the marriage of a naval aircraft carrier and a land-based runway sort of crashed together in his mind and conceived the idea of what if, rather than using short-range Navy planes, what if we swap those out and use longer range army bombers. And that sort of flash of an idea became the genesis for what today we now know as the Doolittle Raid. Now, taking that germ of an idea and turning it into a battle plan soon fell to 45 year old Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, who was without a doubt one of the most fascinating characters of the 20th century. Doolittle was born in California in the late 1800s, yet he spent much of his childhood in Alaska where his father was an unsuccessful um, gold prospector. Doolittle was small in stature. He stood just five feet, four inches tall. Yet on all of his military records, he upped his height by two inches. By <laughs> now the Alaska of his youth was this rough and tumble frontier town. And, uh, there were more saloons than grocery stores. He literally watched one of his childhood friends torn apart by wild dogs in the street. And he realized that it was not the kind of environment for a small kid. So in order to survive, he realized he had to learn how to fight. And he ended up proving so good at it that he later became a professional boxer. Now, when he returned to California as a young man and entered college, and he always harbored, even all throughout his childhood in Alaska, an interest in aviation. And so when World War I began, he enlisted in the Army, hoping to learn how to fly. And on his first flight, he fell in love with it. And like boxing, he proved so good at it that rather than send him overseas to fight, the Army decided to keep him home to train new air. He said, quote, <clears throat> my students were going overseas, becoming heroes. My job was to stay home and make more heroes. Now, when the war ended, Doolittle opted to remain in the service because it was the one place he could fly every day and still earn a steady paycheck. Now, this was the early era of aviation. So pilots were out there testing their planes, testing themselves. They were doing races, and stunts, and uh, barnstorming, and things of that nature. And Doolittle, the aggressive boxer, decided he was going to jump right into the fray. He set records for speed. He won a number of aviation records, uh, aviation races. He's also the first pilot to ever fly cross country in less than a day. You know how long it took him? 22 hours to fly. Of course, there was no GPS at this time and whatnot. So he literally flew cross country using Rand McNally road maps <laughs> as he flew all the way across. Doolittle, however, was more than just daring. He was also brilliant. He earned his master's and, and his doctorate from MIT. And he also recognized that one of the greatest challenges facing early aviators was the inability to fly if you couldn't see where you were going. Fog, bad weather, things of that nature. So he helped develop the artificial horizon, which is still standard on airplanes today. He's also the first pilot to ever take off, fly over a set course, and land again using only instrumentation, of course, which is now standard for pilots on planes these days and where you go. Now to accomplish that, Doolittle actually flew in the front seat of a, of a uh, double cockpit airplane, and they put a hood that sort of covered the top of the uh, cockpit and zipped it shut, and a second pilot actually sat behind him in case something went wrong. That pilot had to fly with his hands in the air above his head so that observers on the ground would know that it was actually Jimmy Doolittle that was piloting that airplane. The New York Times summed it up best in 1927 when they said, quote, Doolittle is as gifted with brains as he is with courage. When World War II began, Doolittle was actually working for the head of the Army Air Forces, General Hap Arnold, as his chief troubleshooter. And of course, one of his first jobs was to take this idea for a raid on Tokyo and turn it into reality. Doolittle first looked at logistics. He determined that the B-25 was the best airplane to be able to tackle this audacious assignment. 
And the reason he picked the B-25 was because it had seven feet of wing clearance. So that meant it could just barely slide down an aircraft carrier's deck with its wings avoiding the superstructure or the island and take off. He also realized that because of that small clearance, there's no way that these planes could ever land on the deck of an aircraft carrier again. This would have to be a one-way mission. Pilots would literally have to take off, bomb Japan, and then be able to make it all the way to China uh, in, in order to escape the Japanese. This would require an incredible amount of fuel. He estimated it'd be about a 2,400 mile trip. The average range of a B-25 was about 1,300 miles. So this would require him to literally double how far these planes could fly. To do that, he began to strip the bombers of any unessential equipment on board. That included the lower gun turret, the radios. Uh, literally, actually, he took two boards, painted them black, stuck them out the back of the bombers. They at least looked like machine guns in the back of the plane. All of this, of course, designed so that they could add more fuel. Aviation fuel is very heavy. One gallon of fuel is six pounds. So you can imagine when you're having to literally double how much these planes can fly, how much weight they had to literally strip off of these bombers. Doolittle then had to pick his air crews. Now, the B-25 was a pretty new bomber at that time. Just a handful of squadrons were flying them out in Oregon where they were doing anti-submarine patrols. Mm -hmm. Doolittle went out there, grabbed a, a these crews ordered them all to be transferred to Columbia, South Carolina, and it was there in Columbia, just right down the road from here, where his 79 volunteer airmen ultimately raised their hands to, uh, to go on this mission. With his crews in place, he then transferred them all down to the Panhandle of Florida, which unlike today is full of tourists and hotels and things of that nature. Back then it was, quote, the boondocks, according to one of Doolittle's guys. They could then train there with naval aviators on how to take off in short distances without being seen by anyone. Meanwhile, the Navy began its part of the job, which was assembling its task force of 16 warships under the command of colorful Admiral Bull Halsey. Now, the risks that the Navy was willing to take for this operation were extraordinary. Now, at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, America had three aircraft carriers in the Pacific. Right? The Japanese had 10. Okay, we transferred one from the Atlantic fleet over. We brought the Hornet on board. So even with that, we still only had five. We had half of the carrier strength. Pacific that the Japanese did. Now these army bombers were so big that they couldn't fit in the, in the aircraft hangar uh, elevators. So they'd all have to be tied down on deck, which meant that if they, while crossing the Pacific, ran into any rogue Japanese task force, submarines, etc., there was no way to get these planes out of the way to be able to bring up Navy fighters to be able to defend the ships. So in order to make this passage, they would have to send along a second aircraft carrier, the Enterprise, for so the Navy was literally going to send two of its five aircraft carriers all the way across the Pacific, 5,200 miles in radio silence into the enemy's backyard to be able to execute this operation. So as you can see, the risks to the Navy, to its warships, to the 10,000 sailors who were on these task force were extraordinary. April 2nd, 1942, just 16 weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Carrier Hornet departed San Francisco bound for Tokyo. And of course, the carrier's only protection were those handful of uh, cruisers and destroyers who joined it. And tied down on deck, the Hornet with the wheels chalk stood 16 B-25 Army bombers. Here's a close-up shot of one of them. The bombers had so little room that the tail of the 16th plane literally dangled over the carrier's fan tail. The task force steamed across the northern Pacific, taking a route that guaranteed cold, rough weather, but it also decreased the likelihood that they would run into any stray, you know, warships, uh, patrols, you know, merchant ships, submarines, things of that nature. Weather, of course, was so challenging, as you can see here's a ship refueling, that they lost several sailors overboard during refueling exercises. Now, as the task force neared Japan on April 17th, 1942, Doolittle and his men held a brief ceremony on the deck of the Hornet, acquiring Japanese medals given to American sailors during a 1908 visit to Yokohama to the bombs that would soon fall on Tokyo. Here's a close-up of one of those medals. Other sailors scrawled messages on the bombs, like the one penciled on the pen here that says, quote, I don't want to set the world on fire, just Tokyo. 
Uh, another read, Bombs Made in America and Laid in Japan. Afterward, airmen loaded their ammunition in preparation for the coming raid. Now, an important player in the two little stories, Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, who was the architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, Yamamoto was the son of a samurai warrior, but he also later studied at Harvard, and he understood America's great national resolve. He's also one of the few figures in the Japanese military hierarchy who had resisted going to war with the United States. Now, in the wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese public, of course, was celebrating their nation's many successes. And it was a celebration and a euphoria that Yamamoto disdained, because he feared that America's aircraft carriers, missing the attack on Pearl Harbor, were going to come back and haunt Japan. And that fear grew into an obsession for him. He demanded daily weather reports over Tokyo, and only on days when it was cloudy or rainy and bad weather for bombing, for example, would he relax. Yamamoto went so far as to advise a geisha from the mist to move all of her property outside of the capital. Now, Yamamoto's fears led him to create a fleet of picket boats, like the one you see here. The Japanese were not early adopters of radar like we were in the United States, believing instead that lookouts were a far superior means of spotting the enemy. So these picket boats, which were stationed anywhere from about 80 miles to 1,000 miles offshore, functioned much like a defensive net all the way around the idea being that these boats, armed with radios, would spot any approaching American task force and radio ahead that the Americans were coming. Beyond his fleet of picket boats, however, Yamamoto began pushing for Japan to consider attacking the United States again. The reason being is that in the, in the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States had used some of its carriers to pursue raids on far distant islands in the Japanese Empire, places like New Guinea and Marcus Island and whatnot. And Yamamoto knew that it was only a matter of time before those aircraft carriers didn't show up off some far flung island, but instead appeared in the waters right off of Tokyo Bay. And the problem was is that the United States treated those aircraft carriers like an endangered species. We would go in, attack somewhere, and vanish. And he never had a second chance to try to knock out those carriers that they had missed at Pearl Harbor. And so he, he originally wanted to go back and hit Hawaii again. But the Japanese army would never go to that. So instead, he set his sights on Midway, which is a small, windswept coral atoll about 1,200 miles from Hawaii. And at the time, it was home to an American submarine base and an air station. But in this desolate, wind-blasted rock, he saw a priceless piece of Pacific real estate, one that he knew the Americans would never let fall and would force them to bring their carriers back into battle and give him that second chance to wipe out America's carriers. <coughs> Unfortunately for Yamamoto, not only did the army not go for his plan, but neither did many people in the Japanese Navy. And so here he was in April 1942, unable to find a way to do it, to, to finish off America's carriers. Little did he know, however, that Jimmy Doolittle was about to help him make his great sales pitch on this. Meanwhile, each hour, each mile, the American ships were getting closer and closer to the enemy's backyard. And throughout the task force, the earlier excitement of the mission had been replaced now by soaring tensions. This radio men literally hunched over at their receivers 24 hours a day, monitoring Japanese communications for any sign that the Americans had detected. No one stewed more than Jimmy Doolittle. The Hornets chaplain saw him one night literally pacing from rail to rail, the weight of this entire mission all these lives, the airmen, the sailors, everyone, literally resting upon his shoulders. Early in the morning of April 18th, the uh, carrier's radar began to light up with blitz. These were those picket boats that Yamamoto had positioned out a thousand miles off the coast of Japan. Now, rather than engage, American forces decided they would try to sort of thread their way through, like threading the needle through all these picket boats, trying to get as close to Japan as possible. Literally every mile, every hour mattered at this point. Finally, at daybreak on April 18th, however, uh, the gig was up. The Japanese picket boats spotted them. American forces sprang into battle, ultimately destroyed several of these picket boats, captured a few Japanese prisoners. All of this, however, <coughs> to no avail because the Japanese were able to get off a, a radio mission that the Americans 
So literally all the surprise efforts, all that cat was out of the bag. They were coming. Now, the challenge, of course, that Jimmy Doolittle faced at this point is they're more than 800 miles away from Japan. Now, when Doolittle had planned this operation, he set 400 miles as the, as the proper spot to be able to take off. At 400 miles, his men could take off, bomb Japan, and still have enough fuel to make it to China. He set 650 miles as the outside maximum range, which his men could take off and accomplish their mission, and still safely make it to the back of Asia. The problem is, they're more than 800 miles at this point away from Japan. Taking off now is virtually suicide. So what are they going to do? The weather that morning was atrocious. Heavy seas crashed against the Hornet, sending water over the carrier's bow. Doolittle climbed into the cockpit of the first bomber. Just 467 feet separated him from the cold of the city. He raised his thumbs up sign and, uh, to the signal officer to clutch the checkered flag. Sailors pulled the wheel chocks out as the officer waved his flag in circles, signaling Doolittle to push the throttles all the way forward. Everything ready? He asked his crew chief, everything's okay, Colonel, came his response. The signal officer dropped the flag and Doolittle released the brakes. The bomber roared down the flight deck at 8.20 a.m. Doolittle passed 50 feet, then 100, then 200. Quote, he's never gonna make it, someone on deck shouted. The bomber charged toward the end of the flight deck and then appeared to vanish. Doolittle's gone, one of the Army navigators thought to himself have to make it without it. But then the bomber roared up into the gray skies of the carrier's bow. Sailors crowded along the flight deck and the carrier's island erupted in cheers. Quote, the shout that went up should have been heard in Tokyo, the mission's doctor wrote. The other 15 bombers followed Doolittle, one right after the other, flying just, just above the wave tops en route to Japan. The 16 bombers flew in at rooftop level over Tokyo and other key industrial cities like Kobe and Osaka, each plane carrying just four bombs. Crews flew over baseball games, children waved, a few even threw rocks at the bombers when they went over one of the beaches. As the incoming airmen could even see the muddy moat that encircled Emperor Hirohito's palace in Tokyo. This is one of only two known photos that were shot from the bombers. Uh, during this raid. This photo actually shows the Yokosuka Naval Station. This is actually another shot of the same Naval Station there. These are the only two photos that survived the raid taken by the Americans. Now, when I was doing research for this book and, and looking in Japan's archives, uh, we were able to find uh, that the after action report of the Doolittle raid, written by Japanese authorities, survived. It's pretty miraculous for a couple of reasons. Number one, that in the latter stages of the war, is the, uh, America burned down 56 square miles in Tokyo. Uh, and besides, that's also the subject of a book I've got coming out in September, just in case anybody's curious. Uh, so a lot of the records and things like that were destroyed. In addition to that, uh, the Japanese destroyed a lot of their own records, knowing that they were going to lose the war and they didn't want to fall into enemy hands. Uh, yet, the after-action report for the Doolittle Raid survived. And on that report were about 40 images, about two by two in size, that were literally glued down. We were able to scan these in and sort of clean them up. And so for the first time, they actually give us a window into what it looked like on the ground in the aftermath of the Doolittle Raid. And what you're looking at here, for example, uh, is these are several homes that were destroyed by one of the bombers. And it gives you a window. You know, Japan, when you think of it today, when you think of Tokyo, you think of steel and glass high rises and all of that kind of stuff. But the reality of Tokyo in 1942 was that it was you know, largely two-story wood-framed buildings and structures and things like that. And so these images give you a glimpse of sort of what it looked like at that time. <clears throat> this is another photograph of that same property. This is actually a crater from one of the bombers. Um, you can see there from one of the uh, attacks. All told, the raid killed about 87 people. Um, about 151 were seriously wounded and 300 others suffered more minor injuries. 112 buildings were destroyed, another 53 damaged. This is a bomb crater at the Asahi Electrical Manufacturing Corporation. Uh, it was about 15 feet wide and 10 feet deep. It's hard to get the perspective there. This image gives you a little bit better perspective because the, the Japanese officials sort of standing there in the background. 
This is another photograph of an official standing actually inside of a bomb crater. And the crater was about six feet deep and 43 feet wide. It's surrounded by all the debris from the destroyed factory building. You can see it actually blew out a number of the windows on the neighboring factory building as well. This is another Tokyo residence that was hit. And here's another one showing workers sort of cleaning up some of the damage. Uh, now the Japanese, not all of our bombs work, some of them were done. And the Japanese were really um, uh, diligent in sort of digging out any of the ordnance to try to figure out what kind of weapons we used against them. And so what you're looking at here is actually this is from inside of a building where a bomb literally went like right down the side of a building. And you can see there's a sort of a hole there in the background. You can see the workers digging down into what looks like Charleston fluff mud there until they get down about 15 feet and they finally are able to recover the unexploded ordnance there. This is a photograph from the Yamiuri newspaper uh, the day after the raid showing one of the bombers literally flying just above rooftop level through Tokyo. And the headlines, of course, because the media was controlled by the Japanese at that time, were, were filled with propaganda. And one of the headlines on this page reads, quote, as pledged a glorious defense of the homeland. There's a sense of humor to that because this glorious defense managed to bring down not a single one of Jimmy Doolittle's planes. In fact, only about two of the planes suffered any kind of flak damage during um, all 16 bombers made it to Japan, made it out of Japan. Low on fuel, one of the pilots ultimately diverted to Russia, which is just about 600 miles away, where he and his crew were interned for 13 months. The rest of the crews flew on toward mainland China, aided by a tailwind that one raider later called the Hand of Heaven. There, as the airmen closed in on, on the mainland of Asia on China, a few lights popped on. Uh, many of the men weren't sure whether they were going to quite make it. They were looking down. You know, Doolittle was telling his guys to be prepared. They were going to have to put down in the water, get the uh, inflatable rafts out and whatnot. And they looked down and they could see that the color of the water began to change from blue to brown. And that indicated the presence of seven, which means that they were nearing the land. And so at that point then, you see the coastline of China come through the cockpit window of that loud B-25. And the sense of relief begins to wash over these men until, of course, it begins to rain. And it starts pouring. And it's about 7 o'clock at night, and it's getting dark. And the airfields that they're aiming for are gravel runways tucked between 10,000-foot mountains. And so these raiders who have taken off, defied the odds from an aircraft carrier, made it into one of the most heavily defended capitals in the world, made it back out, made it miraculously all the way across the uh, East China Sea, their luck finally runs out. And so they're forced to either bail out at this point or to put down in the, uh, in the surf area on the beaches. And of course, at this time, three of the raiders were killed. Eight of them were captured by the Japanese. And the rest ultimately received help from the locals and missionaries. Now, this is actually a photograph of Jimmy Doolittle shot the day after the raid. And you can see him here. He's actually sitting, really sulking, if you will, next to the ruins of his B-25 bomber there in China. Doolittle was convinced at this point he had no idea what had happened to any of his other planes because they were all flying staggered or whatnot without radios. He had no idea if they'd all been shot down over Tokyo, if they'd made it to China. He's thinking to himself, I'm the best aviator America has to offer, and I'm sitting next to the wreckage of my plane. What happened to these 18, 19, 20 year olds, etc.? He's totally convinced that the mission's a failure. So his crew chief, Paul Leonard, comes up to him and he says, You know, I, I got to cheer the old man up. So he says, You know, Hold on, boss. Mission's not a failure. Fact. I'm convinced that this mission's a huge success. And that not only is it a success, but when we get back to the United States, they're going to give you the Medal of Honor. Of course, Medal of Honor is the highest award for heroism. You know, a tremendous, tremendous honor. Doolittle, of course, recognizes what Paul Leonard's doing. He says, Paul, you know, I, I appreciate it, but no. Seriously, mission total failure. I'm going to get court martialed. So Paul Leonard decides, like, all right, I'm going to have to up my game a little bit. So he comes back and says, all right, boss, not only are they going to give you the Medal of Honor, they're going to make you a general. you got to remember, at this point, he's a lieutenant colonel. So for him to become a general it means he's going to have to skip a rank. Okay? So Doolittle again says, you know, I appreciate it, Paul, but seriously, you're wrong. Uh, now, remember that. We're going to come back to that a little bit, all right? So here's another photo of Doolittle's right plane. And now, 
here's also Dougal with his crew when he's finally got, gotten together with his crew here. And you can see right to his, um, to sort of, our, if we're looking at Dougal to the left of him is, is Dick Cole, who's the last surviving Raider to be able to go by the past week, just a couple of years ago. Um, now these air crews were scattered over about 400 square miles. Uh, and, and like Doolittle, they'd all bailed out and crash landed. Some of them were injured, none worse than Ted Lawson. If you ever saw the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo from 1943, or read the book. Ted Lawson's the one that had to have his left leg um, amputated in a hospital in China. The other raiders had to then make their way across rural China using any form of transportation they could have. Again, they're scattered over 400 square miles. Um, they used sedan chairs, rickshaws. One crew even rode miniature ponies. Um, and everywhere these raiders went, they were celebrated as heroes because China had been at war with Japan since 1937. And the Chinese were elated that America had finally struck back at the, at the Japanese for them. Now, their status as heroes was made official when they reached Chongqing, which was China's wartime capital. There, Madam Chiang Kai-shek awarded the Raiders Chinese commendation medals. Now, Madam Chiang, all the Raiders had this huge crush on Madam Chiang, okay? And Madam Chiang uh, had actually gone to school in Georgia, and she spoke English with a southern accent, like, like, all, like all good people should be. Uh, and so the Raiders called her Scarlet O'Hara accent. <laughs> and so, and she was, I mean, she was young, she's beautiful, she wore these form-fitting dresses, and so all the Raiders felt this crush. At one point, she's like, I would love it if somebody would give me one of their airmen's caps, and of course, every Raider's handing me a cap for her or whatnot. So, at one point, they're all lining up like this to get their picture taken, and one of the Raiders is standing right behind her, and he looks at his buddy, and he goes, man, I can never show this to my girlfriend back home. And Madam Chang turns around and looks at him, and she goes, is she a blonde or a brunette? <laughs> So here's Doolittle there getting his, uh, his commendation medal. But Doolittle's biggest honor awaited him when he got back to Washington. And there he was summoned to go meet with FDR, who presented him with the Medal of Honor. As you can see there, he's getting it put on. Doolittle also learned that he had been promoted to Brigadier General. So the moral of that story, of course, is always listen to your crew chiefs, because they know <laughs> everything. Now, for eight of the raiders captured by the Japanese, the story was far from over. Those raiders suffered horrific torture, beatings, waterboarding at the hands of the Japanese. They were ultimately put on trial in what amounted to a sham procession and were convicted in less than 30 minutes. The Japanese sentenced the raiders to death, but ultimately commuted the sentences uh, of five of them to life in prison. Three of those raiders, however, would ultimately face a firing squad, including Billy Farrow, who was a native of Darlington, South Carolina, which is just not all that far from here, um, uh, down the road in um, past Columbia. Now, on the eve of their execution, the Japanese actually allowed these condemned men to write final letters home. Uh, and those letters, uh, of course, the Japanese never mailed those letters, but those, <laughs> they were miraculously discovered in 1946 in a funeral home in Shanghai. And so what those men wrote, even though it didn't make it home in 1942, it did make it home after the war. And from those letters, we know what these men had to say to their loved ones and friends. And Billy Farrow wrote four letters on the eve of his execution. He wrote one to his best friend. He wrote one to his aunt. He wrote one to his uh, mother. And he also wrote one to his girlfriend that he had met at the University of South Carolina. And he showed incredible maturity for a 24-year-old on the eve of his own execution. This is a little bit in that letter he wrote. He said, quote, her name was Liv. He said, Liv, you're the only girl that would have meant the condition of my life. I have realized the kind of life being married to you would have meant to me and to both of us, and I know we would have found complete happiness. It is a pity that we were born in this day and age. At least we found part of that. Find yourself the good man you deserve, Liv, because you have so much to give the right one. Now, the Japanese came for Billy Farrow, Dean Hallmark, and Harold Spatz on the afternoon of October 15, 1942, escorting them out to Public Cemetery Number 1 on the outskirts of Shanghai. The Raiders were then made to kneel and then bound to three wooden crosses, just like the ones you see here on the slide. 
Japanese placed a white handkerchief around each of the airmen's heads with a black dot drawn to mark the center of the fourth, just above the nose. A single shot killed each of those three raiders. Now, the other raiders would spend 40 months in Japan's notorious prisoner of war camps, where raider Bob Meter actually starved to death. This is a message that the raiders carved into the floorboards of one of their jail cells. And at the end of the war, this floorboard was actually cut out and used as an exhibit in the war crimes trial. And if you ever go up to Dayton, Ohio, to the, uh, the uh, National Museum of the U.S. Air Force there, right Patterson um, Air Base, you will actually see this floorboard on display there. It's an incredibly haunting relic. It's so worthwhile to see. They have a phenomenal display on the Doolittle Raiders in general. Now, the Doolittle Raid, as you might imagine, eradicated the opposition to Yamamoto's plan to strike Midway. American carriers could hit Tokyo, and the flat tops were still a threat, and they needed to be destroyed. However, that June, a 1942 battle proved disastrous, costing Japan four aircraft carriers and ultimately shifting the balance of power in favor of the United States and the Pacific. But it was really the Chinese who suffered the worst. In an effort to prevent America from ever using coastal airfields, as well as to punish those locals who had helped Doolittle and his men, the Japanese launched a three-month retaliatory campaign that led to an estimated 250,000 deaths. Troops cut the ears and noses off of villagers, set others on fire, and drowned the entire families in the wells. The Japanese not only used incendiary squads to systematically torch entire towns, but unleashed bacteriological warfare form of anthrax, plague, and cholera. Now, the U.S. didn't really know, learn a whole lot about what happened in this region of China until about six months afterwards, largely because we had no boots on the ground. In fact, it wouldn't be until October that the first American intelligence officer reached this part of China. However, in the course of my research, I discovered that there were um, tons of American missionaries that were in that part of China. And at DePaul University in Chicago, among their papers, I found uh, letters, diaries, photographs. I even found color motion picture footage of one of the downed Doolittle Raid bombers that they had had there. In fact, the archivist didn't even know what it was until I was able to go through it and look at it. In addition to all those records, they also had the property uh, insurance claims for the destruction of 31 out of 33 uh, missions that they had there. So this was just a literally a gold mine. Now what had happened is much like Sherman's march through the south, is that as the Japanese were coming, these villagers would flee out into the woods. And what you see here are photographs of these missionaries fleeing out. They built temporary shelters out in the woods and waited for the Japanese to go through and destroy a town. And then they would come back and they would send messages uh, by runner farther down the road to let other people know what had happened and to be on the lookout. So, in a letter to his bishop, Father Wendell Dunker actually described what he encountered when he came back to his town. He said, quote, they killed anybody and everybody for no reason at all. Every town they enter is another Nan King on a smaller scale. Uh, Father Vincent Smith echoed him in his own writings when he said, quote, I cannot tell you the full story of the brutalities inflicted on these helpless people, on men, women, and children, even upon babies. No civilized mind can conceive the tortures which were inflicted. Now, at the war's end, the four surviving new little raiders were finally released from prison, all weighing less than 100 pounds. Chase Nielsen would later return to China as a star witness in the war crimes trial. Here, the executioner of the other three raiders, Sotajiro Tatsuda, bows to Nielsen during the proceedings. Four of the men who played a role in the imprisonment and execution of the new little raiders were ultimately convicted and sentenced between five and nine years in prison. Now, Doolittle promised his men on board the deck of the, of the Hornet. And when this mission was over, he was going to throw them all a huge party at his own expense. Now, with the war finally over, and the last of his airmen home from prison camps, Doolittle prepared to deliver. And he threw a party in Miami in December of 1945 that started the tradition that carried on for more than seven decades, one that actually just ended a couple of years. And the traders, year after year, would get together, with two exceptions, once during the Vietnam War and once during Korea. 1959, the town of Tucson, Arizona, the Chamber of Commerce got together and had 
80 silver goblets uh, crafted, each with each raider's name right side up and upside down. So when that raider passed, that goblet could be turned over and the name could still be read. Dick Cole, Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot, crafted a mahogany case to hold them all. Doolittle donated a, a bottle of 1896 cognac to the group. That was the year Doolittle was born. And the idea was that the last two surviving raiders would get together and they would open that bottle of cognac and they would toast the 70 80 dollars. Now, this tradition went on for all these years. And finally, in about 2013, there were only four raiders still left alive. And they were scattered all over from Texas to Montana. Only three of the four were actually able to travel. And the Air Force started getting really worried that this great legend of the Doolittle Raiders was going was to strike out against uh, bad health and they weren't going to be able to get together. So they went ahead in 2013 and had this final toast. They did it up at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And as you, you might imagine, this intimate affair had about 600 distinguished visitors that the Air Force had brought in for what was supposed to be a private event. Regardless, they had the event. They opened up that bottle of cognac and they did their toast to the men. Now, after that, I got together with Dick Cole, who was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot, and I said, you know, Dick, I said, this bottle of cognac, and it was bottled 16 years before the Titanic sank. You know, like, I mean, I'm dying to know, like, what did that taste like? <laughs> and he Dick like, looked at me and goes, you know, he goes, it's actually really smooth. He said, you have the problem with it? And I'm like, yes, yes. Because they were really chintzy how much they gave me. Now, <laughs> that huge affair of 600 brass and everybody there was not actually the end of the Doolittle Raider tradition. In fact, the Doolittle Raiders would continue to get together in 2014, 15, and 16. Until finally there were, in fact, just two Raiders left. And then the uh, uh, Dave Thatcher uh, passed away. And at this point, it was just Dick Cole. And, it is, and so it was just a couple of years ago, and Dick was the last surviving Raider. And so Dick and his family got together with the Thatcher family, uh, and they got the goblets back out. And I'm good friends with Jeff Thatcher, the Dave Thatcher's son, so I, I, he invited me to come along to this. What was a very private and intimate event with just about a little over two dozen people there. And at that, they, Dick Cole held his, his goblet, and they brought out the 1896 cognac and poured it in the cup. And they then, the chaplain then read through all 79 names of the Raiders. And after each name was read, Dick said, here, here, here. And then at the end, he drank it. And so that was actually the true final toast for the two Raiders just a couple of years ago. Now, rewinding back to the 1940s, 1947 back, to actually, the third one of these reunions, crews all went back to Miami for another big shindig, and of course they were full of them and bigger at this time, as you can imagine, and so they had quite a party, so much so that the night watchman left this memo for his boss the next day. And for those who might not be able to read it in the back, I will read it for you. It says, quote, the do little boys added some gray hairs to my head. This has been the worst night since I worked here. They were completely out of my control. I let them make a lot of noise in room 211, but when about 15 of them with girls went into the pool at 1 a.m., including Doolittle, I told them, no swimming allowed at night. Doolittle told us that he did not want to make any trouble. They're going to wait, make one more dive and would leave. But they were in that pool until 2.30 a.m. I went up twice more without results. They were running around in the halls in their bathing suits and were noisy up until 5 a.m. Yes, it was a rough night. <laughs> so the next morning, when presented a, a, this evidence of their debauchery, as you can see here, the Raiders owned up to it. About two dozen of them all signed it. And, uh, and what's great about this is this is actually now an archived document in the Air Force archives at Maxwell <laughs> Air Force Base, recording this legendary night for the Doolittle Raiders. So that concludes my formal uh, presentation. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody's up. Uh, anybody
the question was for folks who might not have been able to hear is when Doolittle was getting his volunteers, to, which, you know, how were they organized? From which squadrons? And it's a great question because the B 25 was literally the workhorse of World War II. We made, we made about 10,000 of them, as you might imagine. However, at this time, there were literally only three uh, units that were flying. So they literally had all of those guys transferred to Columbia. Uh, because they were, I mean, you're, you're looking at less than 300 men, essentially, at that point. And from those men, they then picked their own right. to be. So, so, you know, just the fact there simply just weren't anybody, that, there wasn't anybody that could fly these planes much. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. The, uh, you said the uh, initial, when Doolittle took off, he had 400 plus feet to go. Correct. And you got stacks of airplanes going all the way back to the Fantastic. Did they start their deck runs where they were, or did they all come up? In other words, the last plane, did he have 800 feet? feet he did, yeah. No, as, as, as much as it would have been to create a sense of fairness by pushing everybody up to that bench bar, they, they erred on the side of like, giving them the extra, the extra feet. I would have made him go from 460 yeah. feet. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Did, is there any records of the manufacturer taking bows or credit? Uh, for the B-25? Yeah. Oh yeah, and, that's, and that gets into, I mean, the, the, they, they did a huge war bond drive, as you can imagine, after this, because, I mean, it was a public, public relations masterpiece. I mean, they brought Doolittle back immediately from China, uh, and, and of course, they didn't announce, the U.S. government didn't announce that we were the ones behind this raid for a couple of weeks, and, you know, we wanted to get Doolittle back, and then we wanted to unveil him as the hero of this raid, and so the whole world was being like, who just attacked the Japanese capital? Even the Japanese, you know, public relations officials were, you know, who's the, you know, who was behind this? How are they doing it? You know, until we got Doolittle back, and then we had this just masterful rollout in which you know, a lot of people already knew who Jimmy Doolittle was. He was this famous, you know, aviator, and this was an era in which aviators were like sports stars. You know, I mean, because this was aviation was a thrilling new field, and so this just catapulted him to a whole different level. Um, and so, of course, at that time, you know, Doolittle went to the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the B-25 plant there in Long Beach, California, that built most of the planes and did speeches. I mean, so it was really just a, a massive way to, to help fundraise for the so. Yes, sir. I have a question for some of our World War II veterans. Do any of them remember this and what they were doing when they heard the news of the raid? Um, yeah, and Mike, I might ask you to help us. We have another, like, a roaming microphone. It might be yeah. easiest. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm not sure we did. There's one key on it. I might blow out some speakers. Is this one's attached? No, no. But anyway, yeah. did any of you uh, remember hearing about the Doolittle raid when it happened back in the day, back in the 40s? Yes, it does. Ed, okay, tell us. I was a junior in college, and I enlisted in the Air Force, and uh, I enlisted in August of 42, and that's where I was... Uh, getting ready to go into the service. I was not called until February 43. But I had, the Doolittle Raid uh, was a big promotion for people to get into, become pilots, because there was a shortage of pilots needed. And so he was really uh, big headlines, big uh, promotion posters. <coughs> But he made a big lead, big change in my life because <coughs> you know, anybody that went through what they went through, you got to respect. He was really, that those people are, are real heroes. Who's yeah. face? You said you? Did you say you remember the new little race? All race. Can you stand up a minute and, and tell us? Out so. On the uh, 1943, you called it the Jimmy Doolittle Raid. Jimmy, Jimmy Doolittle Raid, right? But uh, it was not the uh, Army Air Force saying it was Army Air Force. Air Corps, right. Uh, Air Force didn't come on so late. But he, uh, they flew by. 
There's actually work to, uh, it's underway now, the museum's being designed for Columbia, South Carolina to have a Doolittle Raid uh, museum there. And they have a B-25 that was fished out of Lake Murray, uh, which is where a lot of these crews did a lot of their bombing runs and stuff like that. And so uh, they fished one out and then put it back together. And uh, uh, so this museum will hopefully open the next few years in Columbia, so yeah. Now the B-17 crashed a couple months ago, they had it in the ice air force, and because I was controlled by the operator, they asked me, called me, and asked me, oh, I'm not taking a ride on it. Oh, I wow. needed it. <laughs> it. It was a blind thing, <clears throat> and the engine cut out on it. And uh, instead of make, trying to make a normal landing, the guy swung over to the left hand side, and he crashed down. And, Texas. They are able to redo it. It's going to take 10 years to uh, get it back together. And at the time, it was the last piece of the team. So, uh, there are still a lot of history in the aviation world. Respect it. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You a question right there. I, I just yeah. wanted, you alluded to that. Mm -hmm answer uh, to my question, but of the ones that weren't captured and made it to China, uh, how long did it take them to get them back? Yeah, it, it, uh, it, it was kind of a mixed bag. Some of them stayed, and they ultimately flew what was the hump, which was kind of the eastern end of the Himalayas, bringing supplies out of India into China. Some of them were, you know, brought back right away, like Doolittle, uh, you know, um, it's, 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 you gotta remember, these guys went on to fight the whole rest of the war. And out of the uh, out of the 80 Raiders, 61 made it through the war. Uh, some of them got shot down over Germany. I mean, one of them was in Stalag 30, which was the Great Escape, you know? I mean, these guys, uh, in fact, one year there was actually a Doolittle Raid reunion in, in Dayton, Ohio, right next to the Stalag 3 reunion. And it's like, we went to both. <laughs> it was really cool, you know? It's, uh, because that, you, you know this raid, I mean, it's so monumental in and of itself. Like for for these airmen, I mean, it's just yeah. you know. I mean, the sad thing is, you know, I was going through Doolittle's personal papers, and so Doolittle got home. He was just such a gentleman too. Not only was he just this amazing airman, but he got home and he wrote a personal letter to every single raider's family before those raiders got back, and just said, you know, I and he kept copies of them. All. Thank God he was a pack rat too. But you got them all that. They're all in the Library of Congress, and you know, he wrote to them all, and he said, you know. I just want you to know, you've seen the headlines, your son was on that mission and he's safe in China now. And, uh, and sadly, however, mixed in on that is literally like one of the raiders was killed flying the hump in June of 42. So literally like six weeks after this raid. And you know, I mean, literally three flights after the dual raid went down. And the hump for folks who don't know is just a treacherous flight over a part of the Himalayas as you're hauling supplies and you're going up the Kitsi Everest from up there. It's just and when planes were lost in the Himalayas, I mean, it's, they're finding them now. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's, these guys, it was just, this was one of many missions for a lot of them. Yes, sir. I especially enjoyed your account of what happened to the crew that actually went into Russia, the one crew. Oh, yeah. And their journey back to neutrality. You want to talk about that? Yeah, so this one crew, you know, ends up, in Russia, okay, and you have to remember that um, it would have this raid would have been a whole lot easier if the Russians would have allowed the Americans to land in Vladivostok because it's literally right across from Japan. It would have cut that distance you know, and by a third. But the Russians had signed a neutrality pact with the Japanese and, 
early 1941. And so they couldn't, if, if, if they got these Americans and they turned them back over to the US, the Japanese could accuse them of aiding their enemy. And so what the Russians did is they sort of, they said, we're gonna just hang on to you guys as, um, as intern, internees, basically, and, and keep you. And of course, this one crew that lands over there, you know, for them, it's kind of miserable because you know here they are stuck in Russia. All their buddies are still fighting. You know that, that they take them, uh, they put them in this camp, basically in this nice house at Dhaka up in, near Siberia, and they're feeding them black bread and vodka. I mean, this goes on for months and months and months. But if you know you're 22, 23 years old, and you're thinking, you know, that, that tires pretty quickly. You know, I mean, one of them taught itself Russian and all that. And so they eventually hatched this idea. They're like, you know, what, what if we write a letter to Stalin and say, you know, that. You know, it's been a year now. Let us out. You know, we're all on the same time. And so they literally write this letter and they put their minder, they get it translated. And several months later, this military staff car rolls up outside and this officer gets out. And he's like, you know, Stalin's granted your and because they said, you know, either let us go home or because most of these guys are from the South, they said, if not, if not, like send us somewhere warmer. So, um, <laughs> so they, uh, this officer gets out. He's like, "Stalin's granted your wish." And they're like, "We're going home." And he goes, "No, you're going south." <laughs> so they uh, send these guys by train over several weeks all the way down south. And so they, uh, you know, they're down there. And of course, at this point, they're right along the uh, what is now the Iranian border. And so they hatch this. And of course, all their supervisions kind of fades away. And so they're just kind of living there and they're working in an airplane factory there. So they hatched this plan about like, you know, what if we just ran across the border into Iran and went to like the British consulate? And so of course they, you know, they did come up with this elaborate plan and how they're gonna get out and all this. And of course they eventually do. And for the rest of their lives, the, the two pilots argued over whether or not they had, had executed their own great escape or whether the Russians had just teed this up for them to get them out of the country. And so one of the great things when I was working on the book, I mean, this has been like one of the doodle little <coughs> questions, like did they escape or were they allowed to leave? So I was down there, archives, you know, the dusty stacks of Maxwell Air Force Base, and going through there, I discovered this memo, you know, a uh, senior State Department memo that finally answered that question. And um, if you read the book, yeah. you'll find out what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. We're going to be over at, we're not allowed to sell books here in the library. James will be over at the museum right next to the courthouse. We'll be going there within the next five or ten minutes, and you can meet us over there. And he's got some books to sell you. 20 bucks? 20 bucks, yep. 20 bucks, a deal, and he will autograph it for you. Yep. One last question. Yes, sir. I can see right. You're the first one up. I'm one of three books. Southern California kids that can say with great pride, they will go. Jimmy Coolidge went to my high school and graduated. Oh yeah, awesome. <laughs> we all we all grew up on that iconic photograph of that first B-25 coming off the border. Oh yeah, it's all right there. That's a classic. They should name that high school after him. That'd be a great trip. <laughs> they should rename that high school after him. I mean, he's yeah, well, it's not a very elegant name. It's Manual Arts High School. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Doolittle, it, it, he's one of those figures, man, I touched on a little bit earlier. I mean, this is just one part of such an extraordinary career. I mean, like, he's the whole reason that, like, you have 100 octane fuel. I mean, because he realized, I mean, he went to work for Shell Aviation. He was like, sold Shell on manufacturing higher octane fuel because he's like, if we're going to be able to get the aircraft of the future off of blueprints, they're going to need better fuel. And they're like, oh, nobody will ever buy that. He's like, if you create it, I will get the government to buy it. I mean, he just, he was really just one of those just amazing individuals. Uh, okay. Some of you already bought books, so you, you can bring them forward here, and, and James will be happy to sign them for you here. Yeah. George, you had a question? I just wonder, how did the connection between China and America get involved in it? What would have happened if China was still friendly with Japan? Yeah, I mean, um, well, it, luckily that wasn't the case. I mean, you know, at this point, you have to, I mean, Japan had already committed so much brutality against the Chinese at that point. I mean, the rape of Nanking, you know, it was 1937, 1938. Um, 
you know, which about anywhere from 250 to 340,000 Chinese civilians were killed. Um, you know, they had uh, moved into Manchuria in 1931. I mean, that really, I mean, I don't know, had to, I don't know where we would have gone, I guess, at that point, you know, <laughs> had that not been the case. But, you know, the Chinese, um, we actually didn't tell the Chinese what exactly we were going to do because we knew that it was going to bring hell and fury on them in the form of Japanese retribution. So we were really guarded in telling Chiang Kai-shek. And, and plus, we didn't trust him. I mean, his, his government leaked like a screen door. And so uh, we knew that we, for secrecy reasons, we didn't want to tell the Chinese what we were up to. And also for uh, retribution, we also didn't want to uh, let them know. So. Yeah. OK, we're going to have to call it, call it at that. Thank you.